Nature's Archive Podcast, a Jumpstart Nature production. Hey, it's Michael. Let's jump right into it. People will look up and they'll be like, is that a bush growing in the tree 50 feet up? And I'm like, oh, it's three different species of bushes. And you know what they all have in common? They all make berries. So how do you think they got up there? And then most people don't know. How, I mean, I'm sure your listeners probably may know, but like most people don't think about this kind of stuff. And so I'll say, I'll give you a hint. <laughs> so now you introduce this crazy imagery and they're like, oh, a bird ate the berry and pooped that out. And I'm like, yes. And I'm like, this is what blows me away about plants. I have a degree in plant science. Like I'll never, ever get over plants. Like plants will blow. I'll be on my deathbed coughing. <laughs> And I'll be like, did you know that in photosynthesis, like I'm <laughs> stripping out on plants and one of the, they're sitting there being green. Okay. This is what I, this is what happens to me. They're sitting there being green. They make a flower, but it's not just any like, Oh, flower. It's, it's a, it's got an agenda. It's a certain color for a certain pollinator because of where we're at in 2023, we know that the plant might start creating a stronger scent and more nectar when it feels the pollinator land on it. Quote unquote feels. It knows how to make a smell for this creature. This plant knows that bumblebee exists. This plant knows that butterfly exists. This plant, this stinky flower knows that carrion fly exists. How does it know? How does it know? And then, so it's talking to that animal. Meanwhile, it's getting its nutrients and water from another creature unrelated to it, a fungi, a fungi. How did they work that strategy out where they're trading stuff? Okay. So now the plant, so the plant is not just this green thing stuck in the ground. This is a very social organism. Okay. And then it gets deeper. It makes a berry. You're like, oh yeah, cool. Berry's got seeds in it. But a berry also has vitamins in it. It's got nutrition that a healthy bird needs. Like the berry could be like a cereal box and could be like, this is what every healthy young bird and boy girl need. And so the birds eat that and it keeps them alive so they could fly around and poop the plant's babies out. How did the plant know? Like how did the plant know these? And that's just three. So if you think about that, this is a mind blowing planet and there's birds that are in service to the plant that's in service to the birds that's flying around. It's mind blowing. That voice you just heard is Griff Griffith. He's the former host of Animal Planet's Wild Jobs, current spokesperson for Redwoods Rising, and he's a volunteer for Jumpstart Nature. Griff has dedicated his career to honing his expertise in effectively communicating and motivating people to care about the environment from the youth he led at the California Conservation Corps, to people he's engaged with at state parks, to 4 million people that watch his videos on TikTok. He's also been on CNN, NBC Nightly News, Kelly Clarkson Show, and much more. So he knows a thing or two about engaging people. And if you're like me, you care for nature, and you want to share that love of nature with others. So today, Griff shares his secrets to success in ways that can work for anyone, regardless of your personality or your approach. One of Griff's messages is that you have to always make things relevant to your audience. So we're going to try to do that today by including lots of specific examples, including stories like you just heard, discussions about goose pin trees. You might be like, what? A goose pin? Yeah, like a goose like the honking bird you'll hear in a moment. Invasive clams and the magic of photosynthesis. You'll learn about analyzing an audience, being authentic, dealing with doubters, and much, much more. So if you talk about nature with your family and friends, lead trips or walks, or just want to talk nature on TikTok or Instagram, we've got you covered. So without further delay, Griff Griffiths. Good morning, Griff. Good to see you again. Good morning. Super happy to be here. So many people want to affect change in support of the environment, either with their friends or family or in their community. And you have so many videos going viral right now talking about crazy things like hollow redwood trees or redwood forests yeah. that like it's, you know, how I never knew that there were 3 million people interested in that, but that's what's happening for you. Right. So how do you 4 do million that? even now, <laughs> 4, 4 million, million people interested in hollow redwood trees. I love it. So encouraging. <laughs> so how do you do it? What do you attribute your success in being able to reach so many people? I talk about 
what I know. And I talk about what I'm passionate about. And I talk about what I'm excited about. My big sister says that I've been interested in the same things for as long as she can remember. And I've always been really passionate about quote unquote nature and wildlife and plants. And we have some of the most amazing ecosystems in California within walking distance, crawling distance from my house. I live right next to the dunes forest, right next to the beach, right next to the dunes, right next to the redwoods, right next to the river. And so everywhere I go is super inspiring. So I'm just like, whenever I go outside, I'm on this awe inspired high. And then I'm around all these tourists who have questions about it. And so I have permission to talk about what I love to talk about all the time. And that is extremely invigorating. So I'm interested in finding out how people can take the lessons you've learned. It sounds like you have some inherent advantages, though, because you are in crawling distance to some of the best places on Earth. I do. (laughs) That's just my personality type. Other people can get super impassioned. Is that the right word? By things that are closer to home. I, I tell people I didn't fall in love with nature in a area with lots of like natural space. I fell in love with nature in an urban trailer park. Wow. So what was it without going on too far, too big of a tangent? What was it in that urban trailer park (laughs) that got you back when my head was so big that, you know, I had to hold someone's hands to go down the stairs. So I was probably like three or four. My grandma lived in this mobile home park and she took me down the steps from her mobile home. And the mobile home park was very paved very paved. They were, it was pretty much sat on asphalt. And then you have this like little square that was like where the earth had been daylighted that was behind your trailer. And my grandma walked me down the stairs, holding my hand. So I was like three or four. And she got to the bottom and she looks at me and she said, I can call toads. And I was like, whoa, I believed her. Okay. I was like, oh, let's see. And she did this like weird yodel ribbit thing and told me to go turn over this broken pot and I did and there was a toad in there and I picked it up peed all over my hands and I've been in love (laughs) with wildlife ever since super curious and that's what it is I'm constantly curious and there is I can't remember who said it but someone said that ecology is not rocket science it's way way harder so like I'm constantly learning new stuff so I'm in a perpetual state of curiosity and learning and I think that's a good place to be if you want other people to care about the earth the way that you do. The whole premise for our discussion today is I see it all the time in the people I interact with through my volunteering or even online on social media. I see it all over the place on your social Mm -hmm. media. People are constantly asking you, how can I do this? What can I do? So we're already getting into that discussion right now. And maybe before we get into specific cases or specific audiences, I know you have some core principles that you like to follow. And you just mentioned one, curiosity, You know, what else do you take to the table when you're looking to engage people and help to steer them down a more meaningful path to help nature? I like first try to remind myself why I'm talking to them about this in the first place. And it's because I love nature and I care about it. And so I want to come from that place and I want them to care about it too. And I want them to find it relevant. So relevancy is a big thing. Like, we don't want to berate people. We don't want to like, yeah, we don't want to be like, you should do this because it's the rules. There is a time to do that. And there is a place for that, but not, but only if you're like in that activist world, if you're just someone who loves nature and you want to spread it to people, you have to realize that you got to give the people what they want. So you got to be relevant. So you should always make sure your message is relevant, relates to the person as much as possible. If you're trying to impress somebody how smart you are when you're talking about the environment, you're not spreading the love and caring as much as you think you are. You really want to make sure that all your language is accessible using the common language and you want to show passion. And another thing is there's the attention economy right now. So each generation is so different now. Like younger people have seen so many videos and heard so many messages that if they're not an active participant, they may not stay engaged. So when you are talking to people, especially younger people, but also older people, you want to make sure that you're not just lecturing, that you're stopping and asking questions or you're asking if they can relate or you have something for them to involve themselves in. 
So that's really important. And also, instead of throwing a bunch of facts at people being like, this is why you should care about birds. It's because cats are killing them in window strike. All that's important information. But if you could package that in a story, especially a story about your own journey, like I had this outdoor cat. It killed so many birds and I felt bad about it. So I realized that maybe my next cat should be an indoor cat. Like telling stories about where you learned the hard way. Like just whenever we talk about the environment, we should never do from atop a pedestal. We should always be right in there, relevant and accessible with the people because we need folks to care about biodiversity crisis. We need folks to become super curious and have a relationship with nature and beating them into that is not going to work. So you have to make them want to participate. There's so much to unpack from what you just said there. You were saying, don't lecture. And I was thinking, somebody told me once, the only people that like to be told what to do are the people who are already doing it. Yeah. And that really resonates with me. So I can think about many instances in my own life where somebody told me to do something and I probably on one level knew what they were telling me was the right thing. But yeah, it's like your gut reaction is you're not telling me what to do. So, so that's a, it's really interesting human psychology thing there. And I was going to say the stories, I think you're modeling something in the example you gave. So you gave an example of like, maybe you used to have an outdoor cat and you learned your lesson. And the two things there is you're showing that you're fallible. You didn't have all of the answers your whole life, that you were on a journey. And then you're also engaging empathy from other people. Yes. I have made some cringy mistakes in my life around wildlife. Like when I was a little kid, everything I found in nature came home with me. And so, and I had a little tiny suburban backyard with a pond and a giant cage in it where lots of things got thrown in together and everything made it into the pond, including flounders and stuff that I caught in the bay. And almost all those things met their horrible death eventually, but I didn't know better. I was just so curious about wildlife and I wanted to bring them home. And I eventually learned that wasn't cool. Do I prevent other people from doing that? Kind of. One of the things that I did in state parks was I bought a bunch of nets and a bunch of clear buckets and I'd invite families to come catch things in the creek and put them in the bucket and look at them and then let them go. And I think that is a wonderful way to help people up the environmental ladder. That's what did it for me. I just shouldn't have taken all the adults in my life. Shouldn't have let me take everything home. I'm glad they did though. Cause it was really interesting, but at the same time it wasn't good for those species and those creeks that I caught all those stickleback and everything else out of most of them are under pavement now. So the area that I grew up in has been developed and the population has tripled in size. And a lot of those things are gone, but still looking at them, putting them back. If you know what lives in the Creek, if kids know what lives in the Creek, they're more likely to protect it. And that's why I was so disturbed when I saw my creeks getting put underground that has a lot to do with why I'm doing restoration all through my whole entire adult life. Hey, nature enthusiast, do you want to be part of something bigger? Well, we're building a movement at Jumpstart Nature, and we've just added some new volunteers to help with our podcast and website. But this means our costs are going up too. I need to purchase software licenses to give them access to the production tools we use. For example, one media editing license costs $21 a month. And this is where you come in. Please consider supporting our mission by contributing to Jumpstart Nature through our Patreon or direct contributions, or even purchasing some logo merch. Check out all these options at jumpstartnature.com slash donate, also linked in the show notes. Not ready to make a financial contribution? Then please share this episode with three friends. Sharing what we do is actually one of the very best ways you can help us. Thank you all for your continued support. Let's say you were to encounter a group, or it could be a family or something like that, along one of these creeks. Unfortunately, the ones that probably come to your mind don't exist anymore, but some other creek. And they are playing in the creek. They're actively doing something. How would you then engage that group to ensure they're on the right path and getting the right messages from their experience? I'd be like, hey, what's up? I'm Griff. What did you guys, what are you finding? Oh, interesting. Do you know what that is? That's a blah, 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 blah. They are really good food for baby salmon. And you know what? Our baby salmon need all the food they can get because they're an endangered species. So you guys are going to leave these in here for Sammy snacks, right? Cool. That's how I do it. 
Sammy Snacks. So, so maybe Sammy <laughs> Snacks wouldn't resonate with a group of 30 somethings, but <laughs> no, that <laughs> was, kids, I yeah. was thinking, fa- I was thinking family. <laughs> yeah. You've been an environmental educator, a nature interpreter in one form or another for a long time. And you've become quite skilled at being able to look at an audience, whether, whether it's online, in person, outdoors, in the parking lot, whatever, and assess the audience and figure out how do I craft my message for this audience? Can you walk me through how you do that? When you have an audience, informal or formal, expected or unexpected, how do you decide your approach? I ask questions. So I come in looking happy and glad to see them. You're happy to see them. You're happy they're out here looking at nature because these people, like as a conservationist, I look at these people, if they're already outdoors or meeting you someplace uh, outdoors or whatever, they're already interested in the outdoors. So in a sense, you're talking to the choir, but sometimes the choir needs to learn the lyrics to a new song. And this is the willing participants here. So you want to ask them where they're from, why they're here, just try to get some sense of what might be most relevant for them, like what, how you could tailor the messaging of your place. So just to get, give you a really specific example, like when I'm in the Redwoods and I walk and I'm in uniform and I walk up on a group of people and I look at them and I immediately start to make observations about them that could help me be more relevant to them. So their age, of course, because the way you would talk to kids is completely different than how you talk to a group of older people. But families love it when you incorporate stuff their kids are going to understand. So you, that's the first thing is you just try to get some demographic information by observing to try to just assume what might be relevant. But be prepared to be wrong. And then if you just come with respect, then you don't have to worry about it. And you could figure out like what they're interested in and then just try to, if you have the knowledge in the background, make it relevant to them. Depending on the age group, you might want to gamify whatever you're doing. So if you have a bunch of junior high kids or even fourth grade up, you might want to gamify it. And if you're in nature, so you can do that through one of your app tools. People have phones, that is, iNaturalist or whatever. Or you could come with a scavenger hunt or you could teach them a couple plants and then be like, let's see how many more we can find down the trail. But you try to make it relevant to whatever group. If it's an older intellectual group that already obviously has a background, then find out what they know and try to make connections to the place and make it relevant. But whatever your audience is, you want to make sure that it's engaging. So you want it to be fun for them. You want it to be an experience for them. You want them to get more curious because you don't want this experience to be about you. You want the experience to be about building them up to be more curious so they'll go on and learn more long after they forgot who you were. So you just want to impart on them this curiosity that will keep them going when you're part of the past. I think those are all good thoughts. And the one that I think resonates most with me is asking questions, try to validate those assumptions. We've talked about some really good approaches and principles already. And I'm thinking that we can dive into some very specific scenarios to make it more real for people. And and we're talking about relevancy. Let's make it more relevant to anyone listening. And one of the things that I see a lot on your social media is people ask you, they say, I love what you're doing, Griff. How can I do it too? And if we take them literally for a moment, and let's say they want to create some social media videos to reach their people, their friends, their family, their followers, how would they start? What's the process? And you could maybe walk through your hollow redwood tree viral video as an example. Yeah. Anybody who wants to do that, please do that. The more repetition, the more people run across conservation videos, the better. And it's the same thing as if you were meeting a group of people in public to take them for a walk through the redwoods or whatever. You want to talk about what you're most passionate about. So with the current video that's going viral, It's on goose pin trees, which are really old redwood trees that have been through many fires so that the fire was able to penetrate somewhere on the redwoods thick, almost sapless bark that's not extremely flammable. But it's burned through there and over this long process, it's hollowed out and it looks like this big creepy tree that a fairy would fly out of. And people love the way it looks. So it's just the hollow goose pin tree by itself is a great story background. But I love the story for so many reasons because people formed these. It was the 
in this case where I live now, it was the Talawa people whose frequent fires or the Yurok people whose frequent fires created these things. So that's a really interesting story about how it was created. And then also the tree's hollow, but still alive. So you can look up and you could show people the leaves up there. It's still alive. There's so many interesting things about just how this tree formed and the fact that it's hundreds and hundreds of years old. Because usually if it's big enough to be like a hollow room inside, we got 115 fourth graders in a hollow tree one time, seriously. <laughs> so it's like, these things can become huge. So right there, it's captivating. Like your, what you're talking about is captivating. But then you tell people that grizzly bears used to live in those and grizzly bears are now extinct in California. So there's another story. And the story about the last grizzly bear getting killed in California is fascinating. And the one on our flag, Monarch, is fascinating. Those are fascinating stories. So there's so many fascinating stories tied to this. And then there's bats in there at night. There's or bats in there during the day. And there's Vox is swifts at night. And so there, there, you have these birds that are tornadoing into this hollow tree while bats are flying out. They're doing wing high fives. There's so much imagery here. There's such a great story around this one hollow tree. And you could tell so many different versions of it. And so that's if you do conservation social media, you want to do it about what you're passionate in because there's so many people on social media now. If you hashtag it right and do the captions on there, the algorithm is going to send your video to people who are interested in that subject. You're like, oh, well, that's preaching to the choir. But that's okay because the choir will support your video and they'll help you get better at it. And then pretty soon it will get put on the For You page or it will get into some general stream. And then you could attract a bunch of people who maybe find hollow trees or giant trees really interesting there's niches for everything and that's why you if you do social media folks don't try to be me don't try to be someone else double down on what you're already good at and you will eventually find your audience and they will be grateful for your content and then you can also convert some people who maybe would not have gotten interested in a climate change content creator but are super happy to hear the big tree hollow tree person series <laughs> so just doubling down on what and on what you're impassioned about is step one step two is take everything frivolous out of your videos just get right to it no long introductions nothing just get right to it tell people what they came here for make the video about them like really think about your audience and give people what they want as long as it's factual but make it edutaining a lot of people aren't going to listen to some boring stuff because they have billions of options so you can't be boring you got to be you got to take your you got to have a lot of consideration for your listeners time you mentioned two steps and backing up to the algorithm. I think we can think of the algorithm as almost like a multi-step function just to maybe put an additional point to what you said. The first goal is to get people seeing the video, even if it's the choir, and then by mm -hmm. making it engaging so they look at it, they watch it through, and if those metrics are good, then the algorithm executes on the second step, and that's showing it to even more people getting beyond the choir. So is that yes. roughly correct? Yes. And usually the way to make it more interesting is just is to really just double down on being yourself. Don't try to be someone else. Don't try to be the, the nature documentary person that you grew up watching. Just really be yourself and you'll eventually find your own audience. And you might find out that social media is not the way that you're going to be helpful. And that's fine, too, because there's a million zillion opportunities to help conserve, preserve and restore nature and, and species. You mentioned like hashtagging it well. How do you go about hashtagging your videos? You don't want to overdo it because they'll think that you're spam. So you don't want to have like more than five or six. Like more is not better when it comes to that. But ultimately, trying to game the algorithm is not absolutely necessary if your quality of your videos are good, if they're engaging, if they're fun. And I think that what I'm finding, I don't have any studies to back this up or anything, but... I think the reason why I'm having so much success on social media and have in several different forms since I got on social media and I was, I got dragged onto social media kicking and screaming by the youth I used to work with in the California Conservation Corps. And then one of our first videos went viral and that's how I've been stuck on social media since. But it's with social media, I just have found that it's a great way to get information out about conservation. It's a great way to help people move up the ladder of environmental care, as you put it. It's very effective. And so I've learned that I can't turn my back on it. But what I want to warn people against is worshiping the algorithm because the algorithms are designed so that you can't game them. So if you put too much energy into that, it's going to waste your time. So I'll just tell you the way to 
besides just making good quality videos, which is ultimately the number one concern you should have. If you're trying to get your conservation message to as many people as possible, the other one is engage with your followers. So if people comment, at least like their comment or acknowledge that you saw it, respond to the ones that are personal to you. Don't feed the trolls, ignore the trolls. Angst does increase the algorithm. So get into a fight with someone will get more people to see. But I'm, that's not me. I usually, if it's not a helpful, if it's not contributing to conversation, I usually ignore it. So I don't, that's not how I want to game the algorithm. I just want to make quality videos. I want to acknowledge people who are participating, want to answer questions. And if you do that, you'll get rewarded. I don't post every day. I post like once or twice a week. I think about my videos before I make them, but I don't think about them so much or script them because I have found out that when I'm doing something too mechanical, I lose the freshness, the zeal. So you just basically want to speak from your heart. So you got to know your subject really well. You should read a lot about it before you talk about it. You should, and then you should admit that you're not the expert, especially if you're talking about science because it's unfolding all the time. So if you marry yourself to one concept and then a new study comes out and you were wrong, you don't want to be all well and defend yourself. You want to let people know that you're a work in progress, just like they are. You're a guide, not an expert. And you're having fun learning about this and you want them to go along with you. That's where I'm coming from. And to bounce off of that, I found in the course of doing a number of interviews for Nature's Archive that it's a it can be a difficult tightrope to walk when you recognize that some of the things that, that we talk about, there are exceptions to the rules. There may be cases that aren't known about a given habitat or the way a certain species lives or something like that. And making a short social media video, you're going to have to gloss over all the exceptions and all the corner cases oh, yeah. and things like that. So how do you become comfortable with just that fact? Because I, I noticed that some of the professionals, some of the academics can't do it. They have to explain all of the exceptions and all of the aspects oh, yeah. that are maybe a little bit different. You have to accept that your three minute video on fire ecology is going to be a gross simplification and generalization of a completely complex topic. And you have to let people know that you have to give people resources of places to go. Just be like, I just skimmed over. There's a lot of factors that I didn't mention, or this depends on the area that you're at because just in California, the fire regimes and stuff that are that the native people, Yurok or Talawak or whoever of Wailaki practiced in this area and shaped these ecosystems and these habitats is different than what the Chumash were doing in Southern California. So you can't apply a fire regime recipe in a chaparral habitat that you could in a redwood habitat. And people have known that for thousands of years until this place got colonized. So now we're relearning that. So when you do a three minute video about fire ecology, this isn't a new science. This is traditional ecological knowledge on this goes back to the time immemorial and then it's been interrupted and then prescribed fires and culture burns the way they're applied can't be generalized so how do you do a three minute video about that you explain that things are different everywhere and if you want more information go to blah 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 yeah and when we start talking about habitats and if a question comes up about why is it different here than say in oregon or some other state it's always interesting to, again, make it relevant and say, and this isn't how I would word it, but just the spirit of how I would word it is things like state boundaries are very recent and nature doesn't adhere to, to political boundaries. Yeah. So yeah. we have to stop thinking in those terms in turn, like California wildfires really consist of 12 different fire regimes. It's not one. Mm -hmm. So the moment you know, that becomes a trigger, you can say next time you hear somebody refer to something with nature relevant to a state, that should be maybe a yellow flag. Maybe there's more to the story <laughs> yeah. than there's what's There's always more to the yeah. story. On my tombstone, I want it, it, it chiseled with a hand chisel. I wish it were that simple because <laughs> that's like my whole entire life. Whenever people bring things up to me and they're like, no, it's like this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, honestly, not to be mean, not to be dismissive, but gosh, I wish it were that simple. I really do. And especially when it comes to like fire ecology and stuff, I wish it were simple. I wish I wasn't about to confuse you even more with my answer. A lot of times as someone who's doing videos or talking to people, like sometimes I'm fully aware that the answer I give is just going to confuse them even more. And so having some resources in mind 
that are very good for beginners is a lifesaver. For example, when I talk about native plants, I got a million resources for someone. And and I'm like, go to homegrownnationalpark.org to find out the plants you're going to plant in your area and why you should do it. Thank you, Homegrown National Park. When people are like, what do I do with this injured wildlife? Like now, thank goodness, I could be like, go to animalhelpnow.org, ahnow.org, download the app to your phone. Like that way they can explore at their own rate. And so if you did confuse them by saying, oh, you can pick the baby up and put it back in its nest if it doesn't have any feathers and because the parents can't smell you. And that's not, that's not what I heard. I heard the mom was going to eat its baby if I touched it. I'm like, no, you can eat garlic pizza and lick that baby bird and put it back in the nest. And the mom will still feed it. That makes it memorable. Yes. <laughs> that's and probably relevant to the garlic pizza eaters too. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they got pizza boxes in their trash can right now. So it's, you want to be relevant. You want to give really simple resources and some places have made that super easy for us. So have them ready, have them ready. Something I'm detecting as well here, and, and maybe I'm putting my own personal lens too much into what you're talking about. So you've been advocating that talk about things you're passionate about, things you know about. I've sometimes had a ton of passion about things that I don't know much about, but I want to learn more. And mm -hmm. back before social media in a couple different worlds I've had hobbies in, I started a for beginners column, a written column. So I mm -hmm. had the benefit of being able to say, yeah, I'm not an expert. I'm a beginner too. I'm writing this with other beginners in mind and let's go on a journey together and learn about yes. this thing. And I wish more people would do that. Yeah. And that's a perfectly viable way to start videos if you're just getting into this. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people who are super introverted that don't want to do videos and don't want to put themselves out there like that. They're more comfortable laying back in the cuts and having those people along on one of your social media journeys will be helpful because they might know a lot about the subject and would rather you talk about it. So they'll comment in there. So say like, I'm really interested in tide pools and I just moved next to the beach and I don't know what half these things are, but I'm going to go out and find them and I'm going to try to figure them out. If, if you have a way I can learn about this, put this in the resources and make it that engaging because there'll be a lot of people who want to participate. People want to participate. People do want to scroll and get lost and blah, blah, blah. I, I get it on social media and other people want to participate. So one of the, if you're teaching, like say like on TikTok or something or Instagram, if you're teaching and you want people to go along with you, make sure you say that and then hashtag it learn on TikTok or something like that because other people search for that. I put, that's one of the hashtags that I use all the time and people want to learn with you. So you don't have to be an expert. In fact, there's so few experts anymore, Michael, the way that science has specialized, like there's no way you're ever going to be a generalist expert. Like people, you could study I used to tell my core members in the California Conservation Corps this. I could study the same square foot of forest floor for the rest of my life and never be right about everything because I could study it. I could look at the bacteria. I could look at the viruses in the soil. I could look at all the microbes. I could learn. I could look at all the salamanders that walk across it. I could look at all that stuff. And then one bird could fly, take a poop. That poop could land in my square foot and it would change the chemistry of the soil in that little area and may have a seed in it that now is going to introduce a new plant. And that plant might attract an animal that's going to come and that has some kind of spores on its feet that's going to introduce a new fungus into my one foot. It's never going to stay the same. You're never going to be right. So don't cling to being right. Cling to being a work in progress, a student in progress, and ask people if they want to go with you because that's more real. My takeaway from our social media discussion here is don't overanalyze. Don't work super hard on the algorithm and on engaging with trolls and all this sort of thing. It's be yourself, be authentic, try to engage people more naturally, respectfully and respectfully and do things you like, because that will be apparent to the viewers. Yeah. And it's really important. If don't get caught up in fights and stuff, you want people to help us conserve natural resources and wildlife and ecosystems and stuff. You want to be welcoming into this into your spaces and if someone's going to be a troll let them be a troll by themselves you don't have to participate in that and that's a whole other topic too if you have 
say on your Facebook page, somebody's being a troll and the other people are engaging with them, how you moderate that or how you admin that. I don't think we need to go into that right now, unless you have a, any quick tips. I would just say like, if someone's being cruel and mean, just block them because you don't want to create a culture of that on your social media because you want people to feel safe to learn. And if you have someone bullying people who are at different education levels, they're not going to stick around to learn. And it's more important to have 20 learners than it is to have one know-it-all. It's better to have one learner than it is to have one know-it-all. I don't let those people have a platform on my page. If you build a platform and you have a million followers, like, and someone else wants to put their message out there real big, they don't have to do it on your platform. They didn't contribute to this. They're not your partner, collaborator. <laughs> it's like yeah. they need to go do their own platform. Yep. So like you just don't waste your time with them. We're trying to save biodiversity. We're trying to teach people. We're trying to create a safe, respectful place. And if something messes that up, they need to go find another ecosystem to live in. So mm -hmm. I haven't forgotten. I said we're going to go through some example cases and we kind of got stuck on social media here for a moment, which is great because that's one of the best ways that you can reach people and one of the ways you've been super successful. Now, mm -hmm. a more intimate setting in person, like on a walk, if you're volunteering to lead an Audubon birding trip or something along those lines, there's a hundred different permutations. How do you engage people there? And I know you have, you love, I'm going to, I'm just going to pick a specific example for you. You love to talk about seed dispersal. So like, how might mm -hmm. you marry these two topics together and really create an engaging experience for people in person? Yes. Engaging experience, experience. You want to give people an experience. I, it's probably my personality type. I don't even like standing up and giving talks to classes unless I could turn it into an experience. That's why I'm not dying to be speaker at this and speaker at that because it's, I like hands on. I like giving people experiences. And so if you're taking people for walks, you got to think how they can, you can give them experience. Sometimes if you're a really good storyteller, a really good story is an experience, especially if you're walking out, looking at something. So like where I live in the redwoods, we have, there's like zillions of stories to tell, but the, People will look up and they'll be like, is that a bush growing in the tree 50 feet up? And I'm like, oh, it's three different species of bushes. And you know what they all have in common? They all make berries. So how do you think they got up there? And then most people don't know how, I mean, I'm sure your listeners probably may know, but like most people don't think about this kind of stuff. And so I'll say, I'll give you a hint. <laughs> so now you introduce this crazy imagery and they're like, oh, a bird ate the berry and pooped that out. And I'm like, yes. And I'm like, this is what blows me away about plants. And this is what, no matter, I have a degree in plant science. Like, I'll never, ever get over plants. Like, plants will blow. I'll be on my deathbed coughing. <laughs> and I'll be like, did you know that in photosynthesis? Like, I'm <laughs> tripping out on plants. And one of the, they're sitting there being green. Okay, this is what I this is what happens to me. They're sitting there being green. They make a flower, but it's not just any like, oh, flower. It's, it's a, it's got an agenda. It's a certain color for a certain pollinator because of where we're at on, in 2023. We know that the plant might start creating a stronger scent and more nectar when it feels the pollinator land on it quote unquote feels it knows how to make a smell for this creature this plant knows that bumblebee exists this plant knows that butterfly exists this plant this stinky flower knows that carrion fly exists how does it know how does it know and then so it's talking to that animal meanwhile it's getting its nutrients and water from another creature unrelated to it a fungi a fungi how did they work that strategy out where they're trading stuff? Okay. So now the plant, so the plant is not just this green thing stuck in the ground. This is a very social organism. Okay. And then it gets deeper. It makes a berry. You're like, oh yeah, cool. Berry's got seeds in it, but a berry also has vitamins in it. It's got nutrition that a healthy bird needs. Like the berry could be like a cereal box and could be like, this is what every healthy young bird and boy girl need. And so the Birds eat that and it keeps them alive so they could fly around and poop the plant's babies out. How did the plant know? Like, how did the plant know 
that this bird was going to fly off, that it had a booty that was going to poop these seeds out. How did the plant know these? And that's just three. So if you think about that, this is a mind blowing planet and there's birds that are in service to the plant that's in service to the birds that's flying around. It's mind blowing. So that's what I talk about. I talk about stuff that blows my mind. So that is, that's so amazing. The way that you did that, it, you even had me like just <laughs> engrossed. As, it's as a you're trip, right? Story. And I think it's a trip. And I think like for me, I, I tend to be very analytical. So we're talking about, okay, we're talking about audiences, but then there's also be yourself. And I'm very analytical. And when I think about this, what's going through my head, just so you know, and maybe if I'm trying to relay this story onto another group of analytical people, like engineers mm. that are out with their company on a walk as part of a day away from the office or something like that. I'd be sitting there thinking, and you know what we have in common? We have mm. sensory organs just like plants do. The plant yeah. knows about that bee because it can sense it. Yeah. The plant knows about these that fungus because it can sense it there's some kind of yeah. chemical pathway that's being triggered yeah how different is that from us we have electrical and chemical sensors that allow mm -hmm. us to interact with the world we just have a, our own egocentric conscious that allows us to be mm -hmm. aware of that i don't know if a plant does or not but making that connection is like we really aren't that different from these trees and these plants <laughs> that are out there that yeah. have figured out how to live in the world, which just blows my mind. Yeah. And that it goes back to something like just, we don't know. You'll never, if you're waiting to be an expert on a subject before you make a video or take people on a walk, you'll never make a video and take people for a walk because you'll never be an expert that it, it's ecology. This is, it's a crazy mystery all around us. There's so many mysteries and so many unknown things and so many things we're learning right now. This is a very exciting time to be alive and to be interested in science. And so I think that being a good storyteller or knowing your audience, like if they're engineers or if they're kids or whatever, and just translating science into something that's relevant for people, that's a very special gift. And I think the way that you flesh out whether or not you have that gift is doing the things we talked about and just being yourself double down on your own personality type double down on your own interests and what makes you passionate that's how you're going to be the most effective contagious teacher and i think the other big takeaway that i hope people got from your story there is that we become desensitized to amazing things when you see it enough mm -hmm. and exactly you you reframed it and you were okay with the fact that maybe some of this specific sciencey sides of it may maybe gross simplifications like we talked about before but mm -hmm. you were able to marry those two things together comfort with simplifying a concept and reframing it so that people wake up to the fact that there's this thing happening all around them that maybe they hadn't considered since they were two years old yes and now they might go look it up and so, and so you might want to tell people, if you're interested in this subject, there's a really good book called blah, 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 or there's a podcast called blah, 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 for more information, like send them on to, so that they can have more experience with e each experience you provide for people should lead to more experiences they can take on their own. All right. So we've covered two scenarios now, social media and more of a planned walk or engagement or something like that out in nature. What if the topic of some environmental topic comes up among your family or friends, a informal situation like that. How do you engage in that scenario? You know, what's interesting is that just the other day, this, I work with Redwood Rising and these Redwood Rising apprentices came over, the like young folks, like in their 20s, late 20s, early 30s, young to me. And one of them says, you've gone viral all these times and you've done all this cool stuff. And how does that work out around your family? Like when you're around your family and you, do you talk about the same things you talk about with us? And I really don't as much. I do with my mother and my nephews to a degree and my nieces, but around my family, I know them so well that I already know what they're interested in. And so like, it's a very specific conversation. And so you should always be willing, if you want your family to get involved in conservation and they're not, try to find commonalities. So like my dad who raised me, he's not a science person at all, but he loves to go off rope swings and he loves to go canoeing 
And so that's the stuff we did together. And that's good enough. Sometimes just being outdoors with people is all the message you need, all the messaging you need. And especially maybe with family and stuff, family doesn't like to be preached out by family. And a lot of times family doesn't even want to be taught by family members. So if you want your family members to be more into nature, chances are the best thing to do is to plan a picnic at the river and just let them discover things. And they know that, you know, and they'll bring you a shell and ask you what this is. And then you can ruin their whole day and tell them it's an Asian clam that's an invasive species. <laughs> yeah. I, unfortunately, speaking of days being ruined related to <laughs> Asian clams, I recently learned that there are multiple species of Asian clams that have invaded. <laughs> so it's, it's even worse than I realized. I have the distinctive honor of being the person who found a new Asian clam in Ill River. Mm. Invasive clam. Yeah. What a great honor that was facetiously. <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. It's it's a totally different scenario with family, and that could probably be a volume of books <laughs> for some behavioral yeah. scientist somewhere as to how to how to be effective in that scenario. And even if, like for the for people who are familiar with the Bible, even in the Bible, Jesus said that he wasn't like accepted as a Messiah in his hometown around his family. <laughs> <laughs> so. so a scenario that does come up with me sometimes, since I've made this leap to change my career and become a full-time environmental advocate, essentially. And some of my friends or my kids' friends' parents, they ask me about it, like, how's it going or why, or maybe a specific topic or something like that. So I do hear that. And I think that's always a good sign. If somebody's asking me, then mm -hmm. that's signaling that they are open to contemplation about the topic, even if I already know they're skeptical. Mm -hmm. And and in these scenarios, we have a different time scale that we're working with. So you mentioned social media, you have attention economy. People are going to move mm -hmm. on in seconds if they don't like what you're saying. Yeah. The first three seconds. Yeah. And when you're on a field trip or encounter a group outdoors, maybe you have an hour, maybe two. I know it depends on what kind of event you're dealing with. So it's, a, it's still a short time scale. But with friends and family, you can have an ongoing discussion. And... Mm -hmm. That's the thing I tend to take away is, okay, first thought that I tend to have is I'm not going to convert someone or tell the whole story right now. What are they interested in right now? What, what was their mm -hmm. question? And maybe I have a follow-up question or two, but if I know that they're skeptical or I know they don't agree, I'm not going to try to change their mind in that first interaction. I just want to keep them in that contemplating zone, help them yeah. continue to ask questions. And I think just going back, I think one of the best ways you can get people to move up the ladder of environmental concern is providing them with experiences in nature too. And not everybody has access to nature. So it, it might look like supporting a gear library and pitching in money so that people can rent buses to take school. It could be something huge like that, but it could also just be like in your circle, taking people for fun experiences outdoors and things that are relevant to them. You don't want to take your super city slicker, tons of makeup, ew, bugs are gross, aunt, out into a wetlands during July when there's mosquitoes everywhere. That's that would be you might ruin, you might make her anti conservationist forever. She'll be like, train the wetlands. I went out there once and got bit by mosquitoes. So you want to be relevant with your outdoor adventures too. Maybe she would be like, if you're next to a big zoo, she you'd take her there, or an aquarium, or a really nice park that's super safe and where she could always see the mall or something like that. So you don't want to like force people. You want to bring people to relevant, fun trips outdoors. And that's a great way to make conservationists. And especially, you know, I think that snorkels and masks are magical ways to get people interested in because people don't think there's much in creeks. And then you put a snorkel and a mask on and just drag yourself across the bottom of a, even a shallow creek. There's all kinds of stuff in there. And that really opens people's eyes. Like you want people to care about creeks, take them snorkeling. And that's like the number one way to get people interested in aquatics so think about experiences being in the real world first if you can if, if you're not comfortable doing social media if you're not comfortable talking to people be the cool aunt or uncle who takes the nephews and nieces out on snorkeling adventures that's who i was like i did that with my nephews so and it worked my nephews are both they're not super conservationists but they're both very empathetic and compassionate towards nature yeah and shout out to keith williams who was on this podcast a couple months ago talking about river snorkeling and what a transformational experience that is for people and for him personally too so 
It's a big yeah. one. Never underestimate. Like that's, and it doesn't have to be a deep creek. It could be a really shallow creek behind your house. It's still going to be interesting. Yep. So, so much of this goes back to making something relevant, making an experience, something that's memorable. And it doesn't have to be as complex as river snorkeling to make something relevant. And something that, mm-hmm. just something in my bag of tricks that I often pull out is most people, even if they're not very environmentally aware, they're, most people are aware of monarch butterflies and the fact yeah. that monarch butterflies require milkweed plants as part of their life cycle. Yeah. They may not know all the details. That may be all they know. And I find that to be a really good way to make broader topics more relevant. Things like native plants and insects. Hey, you know about the monarch? What do you know about the monarch? And you know, this comes up. Did you know that the majority of insects have a specialist relationship? They require an individual plant just like the monarch does. It may not be yeah. a milkweed. It might be an oak tree. It might be a goldenrod. It might be whatever. But the majority of insects require that. And why is that important? And then if there are, if it's a birding group, you have such a great in at that point because it's yeah. almost every bird species requires insects at some point in their life. Yep. And yep. Talamy has great statistics on 600 caterpillars per individual nestling for a chickadee and things yeah. like that. So you can make these connections. So for me, I always try to have a couple of go-to examples that are very flexible for almost any circumstance to make a topic relevant. And that's one of them. Do you have examples like that? Yeah, I often think of like models on how, why I'm interested about plants. There's a lot of different models covering a lot of things that I'm interested in, but I like plant models because it's they're just so mind blowing because a lot of people just dismiss plants as these like green things that are sitting there doing nothing. But I, when I take people for walks, sometimes I'll for state parks or whatever, I'll say, if you're looking for a new god, you should consider photosynthesis because photos like leaves with some gas and some other stuff, but it turns sunlight into sugar. And all of life depends on that. All life, besides maybe some things that live in the ocean vent, depend on photosynthesis. And that sunlight that gets turned into sugar can travel through many different vessels, many different physical vessels, and then still be sun energy at the end and go back according to the law of thermodynamics. And that just amazes me how interesting plants are and, and leaves. And then once people accept that, then you blow their mind and be like, but some plants don't have chlorophyll and some plants eat bugs and some plant, and you can just keep going on and it gets more and more interesting. They didn't need photosynthesis. So being able to photosynthesize isn't a rule to being a plant. There's exceptions to the rule. So all these things are so fascinating to me. And so you could always just point to one plant, even a house plant. If you have a kid inside of your apartment on the 55th floor in New York City, you can still talk about photosynthesis if you have a philodendron in your window. Or you can do it in the middle of the redwood forest. I could go on and on on this topic. Another good plant one that's very accessible is you look at, it could be a redwood tree, it could be any tree, it could be a shrub. And you say, okay, this thing, do we all agree it started as a seedling? at some point. And generally people will be like, yeah, mm. of course I started the seedling. Where did all of this mass come from? It's now it's 30 feet tall. It's a hundred feet tall. It mm-hmm. weighs however many pounds or tons or kilograms, whatever your metric of choice is. Where did that come from? And it's mm. even better if it's, it's in a container built out of air. <laughs> it's built out of air. It's even better <laughs> if, the, if your example is in a container because the soil is limited. And if somebody's uh-huh. like, well, it came from the soil. Wait, how's that possible? It only has what's in this container. Yeah. That means the soil should have gone down in the yeah. pot if it was using the soil. Yeah. And yeah, it's made out of carbon. Exactly. And then from there, it's made out of carbon and you have a hundred additional potential points of relevancy that you can take that story on. Analogies are wonderful. If you're good at analogies and you, you could be a storyteller, it's if you could give people different ways to relate to things that is a magical gift and we really need to do that because we don't want to make science hard to understand we don't want there to be a barrier to understanding ecology nature and conservation is no longer a hobby for the rich because that's what it was like the redwood was the redwoods that we have were mostly saved 
a lot of them be, previous to the 70s, 60s and 70s, were saved by filthy rich people because conservation was something they had time to study for, like during the Depression. People didn't have the privilege of learning about redwood ecology. Now we want to make sure that conservation and science isn't locked uh, just a, a behind a gate and it's a HOA for certain types of people. We want to make sure it's accessible. So it needs all of us, all different kinds of people in all different languages to talk about conservation passionately in person via social media. The earth needs each of us to step up on some level. And you know, I tell people, they're like, I don't feel like I'm doing enough. You know, if you just plant your spaces with native plants and then you notice something cool on it, take a picture of it, upload it, show your friends, just get people curious about whatever you can, because that's how we'll change culture. And that's how we'll make the world a better place. Sounds amazing. So becoming good at being a nature communicator, it does take some practice. And I think one of the lessons here today is just get started, pick topics that you're passionate about that passion will override any of the other maybe flaws that you might think you have but if people want to learn more techniques practice whatever the case might be where can they go where can you find more information i would also just add to that list don't take yourself too seriously watch people who are similar to you okay so if you do want to make social media videos or you do want to take people for tours Go on other people's tours, watch other people's videos, see what resonates with you. Look and see how they're hashtagging things or look and see how they're engaging people. Take notes of what works. So I would def definitely check out social media resources. I'll tell you some of the people that I like. I, I follow on TikTok and Facebook. Native Plant Project with Kyle's interesting, especially if you're east of the Rockies. So Alexis Nicole N Nelson, I think it is, the Black Forager, following her is really cool. So there's a lot of people that you can just put in. You can go to TikTok or Facebook and just put in conservation and find interesting people to follow. And that really helps build your own ideas up and how you're going to do things. Sounds good. And then if you want to take a very academic approach, I'll shout out the NAI. I've talked about the NAI before as well. They have resources to become a certified interpretive guide. And Griff, do you have any projects, anything upcoming that you'd like to highlight? Well, there's a podcast coming out by Jumpstart Nature, which I'll be hosting, which I hope everybody checks out, listens to. And I have my TikTok and Facebook at Redwoods Rising, where I'm working for the Redwoods Rising Project. It's my work project. And it's very fascinating. It's a collaboration between state parks, national parks, Save the Redwood League, and the Yurok Tribe. And we are healing the forest and bringing back the salmon and doing some very interesting solutionary stuff. It's cutting edge, first of its kind, and I hope it becomes a model for all across the United States and the world. Also on Facebook and TikTok at Griff Wild, I talk about nature almost all the time because I'm obsessed about it. I don't know, but I talk about conservation ways that you can help nature and really fascinating things that you can encounter outside. Sounds good. And thanks for shouting out our new podcast that's upcoming. I've talked about the podcast here and there on Nature's Archive in the past. So I'm excited that it's coming to fruition. And for people that yes. want to know more, I'll say that We've been on a journey and the focus and format has changed a little bit. And if you can hold on a couple more weeks, we'll be talking more about what's coming. So look for the trailer to land in a couple of weeks and then the podcast itself shortly thereafter. So more details coming soon. Woohoo! Yes. Stoked. All right. Well, this has been a fun discussion. I hope it gets the wheels turning for people thinking about what they can do day to day. And again, you don't have to be you don't have to like dedicate your life to making TikTok videos or things like that. I think a lot of these tips can just be applied in regular old interactions that we have related to the environment or nature or you name it, climate. These concepts apply across the board. So thank you for giving us the peek inside your head as to how you do it, Griff. Yeah. And thanks to all of you who are willing to do a little something extra to bring people farther along to want to help us conserve and preserve and restore. That's awesome. Thank you so much. All right, Griff. Thanks again. I appreciate the work you do and you. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for sticking through the entire episode. If you made it this far, I hope that it means that you enjoyed it. If so, please spread the word and share this episode with three friends or groups that you think would enjoy it too. As for today's episode, let me know, did I miss anything? Was there a topic I should have covered? 
Let me know at podcast at jumpstartnature.com or DM me on any of my social accounts. I'll do my best to answer your questions. You can find me at Nature's Archive, one word, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I also share photography, nature stories, and much more on those accounts, so you can follow just to stay in touch, too. And despite being called crazy by numerous friends and colleagues, last year I left my tech career behind to start Jumpstart Nature, which Nature's Archive is now part of. For the sake of myself, my family, and the planet, I need to make this work. So please also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash jumpstartnature. I offer some exclusive content and perks, and you can start donations as low as $4 a month. Lastly, please also check out our latest creation. It's the Jumpstart Nature podcast. We just completed our pilot season, where each episode reveals an unseen, surprising, or misunderstood nature topic with the help of experts and our host, Griff Griffith. It's entertaining and inspiring, and even reached number three on the Apple Nature podcast charts. There's much more on our roadmap, but we need your support. So check out jumpstartnature.com for more details. Thank you. Thank you.